Hello, a very good evening. It's three minutes past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. About six months ago, I was flicking through Amazon, as is my want, to see what books are being published later in the year. And I saw that a book by Nathan Law was coming out. And I thought, right, we've got to get him on the programme. And six months later, here we are. And he's on the programme. Um, his book is called Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back, which in some ways... It's a slightly intimidating title, I think, because it might lead people to think, well, it's just about the sort of concept of freedom, but it's actually mainly about his experiences in Hong Kong, uh, fighting for freedom, protesting against Chinese repression, and uh, the story of how he's now in this country, having had to seek political asylum. Nathan, welcome. (laughs) Um, it's quite a story. I've been reading the book over the over the past couple of days, and I, I said earlier that I thought it was the most important book that I've read this year, and it, it really is, because it, it brings... In fact, it relates to what we've been talking about in the last hour. Why, why is it that so many people seem to give the Chinese government the benefit of the doubt rather than maybe their own, their own country, which is a, a democracy? And, and you address that I mean when we decided to do this subject it was literally five minutes later I read this paragraph in your book you say while I recognize that the majority of people who identify with the political left do support Hong Kong the reality is that there is a small minority who do not some are simply ignorant of China and are more focused on the shortcomings of their own societies and political systems others seem motivated less by values which we might share than by hate either way what concerns me is how blind such people are to the basic reality of life in Hong Kong and in China and that kind of I could have just read that out at the beginning of the last hour we we might have not even (laughs) bothered talking about it because I think you sum it up well there let's start off by talking about why you're actually here well, um, thank you so much for the encouraging words and the invitation Ian Uh, it means a lot to me Um, yeah this book I I, there's a big reason why I wrote this book is because I wanted to get um, the stories of Hong Kong told through my lens, uh, what I've been through for the past seven years, from a student's protest leader to a youngest elected um, parliamentarian in Hong Kong at the age of 23, um, to a disqualified um, uh, 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 legislator, and then to an inmate serving jail time, and then for now um, to be an exile activist. Um, we could really see that the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong reflects to what I've been through. And from this particular example, I think that there is a global implication to it, um, that uh, we can really see how fast freedoms can be eroded uh, mm-hmm. with an unchecked government. And it is not only the phenomenon in, in Hong Kong, but um, we can gradually experience it um, elsewhere in the world. So yeah, it, it intends to uh, write for the international audience. And, and I think we, we just have to get the stories out because there are lots of misconceptions about China, about Hong Kong. And um, writing my personal stories can tell a bit of how it feels like to live under these suppression. But also... Um, the, for example, for for people, they may feel like like China is some kind of like model for communism for socialism, but in fact, it it does not have any feature like that. It is a state-led um, capitalist uh, system that really um, amass wealth in the top one percent of people. And in terms of um, politics, they are just uh, trying to use the name of it in order to monopolize all power without really thinking how people can benefit from this system. So uh, I think um, that's part of the book on trying to portray that stories and try to bring out um, these facts about China. You had to seek political asylum in this country. I mean, that, that must have been a big decision because it's quite clear from the book that you, you love Hong Kong, that you yeah. in, intended to spend the rest of your life there, and now you're not able to do that. Um, just tell us about that decision and how you actually ca- came to come here. I'm proud to be, be a Hong Konger. I dedicate um, my past several years to be involved in um, in politics, in protest for the place I s- I was in jail because of it, um, so it really means a lot um, uh, for me to, to see this city to be free and democratic. But the reality is sometimes you have to make difficult choice when you were put in a situation like me last June when you knew that if you stayed, you would be definitely jailed. Uh, and if you left the city and to be in the UK, for example, you can still f- um, free to be talking about Hong Kong, to to be a voice of Hong Kong at the international level. Um, so I made a decision um, for the movement to speak up for it. And when I left Hong Kong, I had to cut connection with my friends because 
whenever they talk to me, they may be seen as um, colluding with foreign forces, colluding mm -hmm. with um, hostile foreign forces. Um, and my family, I when I left Hong Kong, I issue a public statement that I have to sever my ties with them. Because when you look back on how China treats the human rights defender there, they're not only persecuting these people, their families are being surveyed, being harassed, or some are even going to jail with them. I just don't want that from happening um, in my family. So I, I just had to do it. And, and you just need to understand how difficult and draconian the situation is in Hong Kong. And through looking at my story, you could have a um, better understanding of it. And presumably, you don't even know if your family and friends have read your book. Well, no. it's, only, it's only just come out, so they probably, yeah. they probably <laughs> wouldn't have been able to anyway. But the fact that, I mean, you, you have a, a message to your mother at the end, which yeah. is so touching. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure that this book, you, you, you cannot find it on the shelves no. on Hong Kong's bookstores, because for now, I'm a wanted person. I'm, I'm wanted in Hong Kong, literally, under the national security law, because of my advocacy for free Hong Kong and for, 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 for the city's democracy and holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable on a global level. Um, and if I were to step foot in Hong Kong again, I would be submitted to decades of imprisonment. So I literally have to wait and, and do something until Hong Kong is free and democratic so that I can go back to this city I love and I dedicate. You, you say that you were apprehensive about when you left, whether you thought you would even be allowed to leave. And you talk about sitting on the plane, looking down at the city and thinking, well, I may never come back here again. I mean, that, that I can't imagine how, just psychologically, how that must have felt. Well, to be honest, on that plane, I, I literally collapsed. Um, I was so nervous uh, on the process of going to the airport, being in the airport, um, thinking about everything, thinking that whether I would be arrested. I, d I just didn't really have time to conceptualize what it means to leave mm -hmm. Hong Kong seemingly eternally. But when you were on the plane, when the plane was taken off, and you finally had the time to really face that reality, and when you look back to the nice gate of Hong Kong, it really touches me that it is so beautiful and it is it resembles to the city that I truly love. But I can... Basically, if you, I had a chance to go go back, it would probably be decades. Yeah. Um, so it, it really made me kind of like had a emotional collapse at, at that point. I, I finally realized that how heavy it is. Um, when was this exactly? Um, it was at the end of uh, June last year. Right. So it's been almost um, one and a half year. And I mean, I don't even know whether you can talk about this, but do you feel under threat? I mean, the Chinese Communist Party can reach quite far out, can't it? Um, we all understand how extensive these authoritarian regimes or even totalitarian regimes' uh, arms um, could be. And um, I always keep my guard on. I always be vigilant about my surroundings. There are recent news saying that there are some groups of um, like pro-China people that are putting like 10,000 pounds for my whereabouts for my address and things like this these kind of small or like threatening messages uh, have been ongoing quite a lot i just have to be be careful and be sure that um i i have the capacity to try to keep myself safe how have you found living in the uk so far well i think actually um london is a very welcoming city it is very mo 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 um it, it welcomes people from all around the world. I, I don't really feel like um, there are lots of problems of settling. Of course, um, getting into a new country, to a new set of culture, is definitely not easy, but I think um, it is a very welcoming city. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I um, chose to stay in London and to continue my international advocacy work uh, right here. I'm talking to politicians, um, policymakers, civil society actors from around the world. It is a great place to be in. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, you you talk about it's fairly early on in the book about your your family were, were not in Hong Kong. Your your father actually he he was he spent three days in a rowing yeah. boat getting to Hong Kong. Yeah. Just talk about your early life because you spent your first three years not in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, so my father 
swam from mainland China and and of course took a boat tri- boat trip or a raft trip from from mainland China to Hong Kong in the late seventies. It was a very dangerous trip. Um, he saw a lot of floating bodies um, in in between um, uh, the channel, and he finally made it. And for him, it, Hong Kong meant hope and refuge. If you look at his village back then, there was no food. Um, there was only one way to survive is to escape. So Hong Kong meant not only place of like a uh, pearl of Orient, but also literally life and hope for them. And you fast forward four decades later, there are literally a lot of Hong Kong people leaving the city. The city no longer means um, refuge and hope for them. It means repression. And that's what a lot of Hong Kong people feel like. Um, I, born, I was born in mainland China in 1993, and I came to Hong Kong in 1989. But then um, I didn't know much about the differences in between Hong Kong and China. Um, I, I wrote that six, scene. Why would you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I wrote that scene of me crossing the border. The only thing that could remind me about the differences was the currency. My mother gave me renminbi, which is the currency in, in China, and Hong Kong dollars, two bills for me to keep. And I, that was the first time I realized um, there are two, two systems. And when I grow up, I realize that um, their differences are much more than just currencies. It, it means different way of understanding government, understanding society, different f- set of freedoms, um, means different way of life, different values. Um, and for me, I wasn't political at all at the beginning because my parents didn't really talk about politics. Um, I think that was just too traumatized for them. And uh, not until I went to high school, attended uh, the very first um, Tiananmen Massacre, vir- candlelight vigil, commemorating the fallen in 1989, um, democratic movement in mainland China. And also when Liu Xiaobo got the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2010, um, the very pro-Beijing principles um, of my school denounced him publicly on the next day. And it really triggered my curiosity why someone like a Chinese getting such an important prize will be criticized in that fashion. So these things combined really triggered my curiosity and then I decided to become a student leader when I was in university. Because in some ways you, you were a reluctant leader, weren't you? I mean, <laughs> you, you would seem to me reading the book to be motivated just by a desire to protect freedom and democracy in, in Hong Kong against the repression that you could see that was gradually being yeah. introduced. Well, um, I remember when I first was elected as the head of the student union, I promised myself it was a one-term thing. Like, I would definitely step down. All politicians say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I promised myself not to overcommit. Um, I live in a blue-collar family. My, my father was a construction worker. My mother was a street cleaner. I, I was taught that I should provide. Um, so being involved in politics in Hong Kong is not fashionable. It means a lot of risk and also of persecution, and it may mean that you you are not being hired by certain big companies, etc. If you continue that path, so at first I felt like oh, it was just one year thing. When I step down, I could be in an exchange program, maybe maybe I could learn some new languages. Um, but eventually, when you got involved more and more, you witness more injustice, and seemingly you felt like there are things that you consider right and you ought to do it. It was not an intentional thing that, oh, because you wanted to be a politician or because you wanted to be an activist so that you these so, you do these sort of things. It was at the moment uh, when you have experienced more and more injustice, you just felt right, felt like you ought to resist. It's very natural. And that were, there was a, a quote from uh, Frank Love Havel, um, the very first um, a Czech president and uh, a famous dissident um, said, um, you, you, no one choose to, to become a dissident. Is whenever you do something with your conscience, you felt ought to do so, you become a dissident in that way. And I think that pretty much summarizes uh, what I've been through. 
Well, there are so many more questions that I've got, but we want to also hear from our listeners. We've also we've got several who want to talk to you directly, and they'll be able to do that in a few minutes' time. 0345 6060 973. If you're just tuning in and wondering who we're talking to, it's Nathan Law. Um, he's written a book called Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. He led or was one of the leaders of the protest movement for freedom in Hong Kong. We'll hear much more from him in just a moment. It's 17 minutes past eight. LBC. It's- Ian Dale on LBC. Nathan Law is with us. Um, Nathan, tell us about the first protest that you took part in. Well, the first protest I took part in, it was around late 2013, 2014. It was about, um, actually about a TV station that in Hong Kong, it was obviously denied a license because of political reasons. But then you could gradually feel Hong Kong um, our freedoms are gradually eroded um, in a slice and bit, uh, bit by bit way, and that was actually something that um, like piled up in my in my mind to 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 compel me to be involved in 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 activism. And gradually, I was from a no name and then being put under spotlight and then become a public figure and and being seen as. One of the representation. How, how did that happen? Because you, you was it because of your youth that you, you were seen as sort of somebody a bit different, and you therefore became the face of the protest movement. I think it's just I was in in that position in that era um, in twenty fourteen when the umbrella movement took place. I was coincidentally um, the head of the student union. I participated right. in. The only dialogue. Timing, eh? Yeah, the timing. <laughs> with the negotiation with the government, I was one of the five um, student representatives. Of course, there are some characteristic personality features that made people like or fellows push me to that position. But uh, I, I think in 
in a nutshell, it's about time. It's about in in this time we need people to show the show the 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 responsibility. And I was constantly on that timing. And I mean, at, at that point, the. I mean, I think we, maybe we ought to go back a little and go back to 1997 when the, the British left yeah. and, the, and China took over and there was this uh, two systems, one country agreement between Britain yeah. and Russia. And it was really only, what, 2014, 2015 when the Chinese began to refer to that as a historic document, as if it wasn't live anymore. Yeah. And, and it was around that time that the the, the 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 erosion of freedoms and the introduction of more repressive measures that that started to happen, and then it developed into when you got elected to the legislative council, uh, they they retrospectively changed the law, which yeah. meant that you were no longer a member of the legislative council, even though you had been democratically elected. Yeah. So it was a gradual process, wasn't it? It wasn't suddenly one day. China decided, right, we're going to do this differently. It, it, it was very gradual. Yeah, we can really see a, a change of trajectory when Xi Jinping got his power in 2012, 2013. He introduced a lot of different measures to try to curb um, the civil society and freedoms in mainland China. And that trend uh, really transplanted in Hong Kong in recent years. If you look at the suppression in 2014, the umbrella movement in 2015, um, the election results in 2016 that I was elected um, duly, but um, subsequently they reinterpret our constitution to set up a legal loophole and then to retrospectively apply it to the, to, to the our swearing ceremony which um, took place before. It, they are just too absurd um, and it is definitely a gradual process and in the book I, I try to depict how those gradual process uh, were in place and to remind people that um, actually they, they do a bit step by step and if you um, look at it carefully you can always to see those traces and why they did that and and these are symbols of um, an eroding free society and if it happens not only in Hong Kong but in elsewhere you then you know that there are something coming and mm -hmm. I think that is the implication that I wanted um, to give the world from this book that please don't take freedom and democracy for granted and you just have to be vigilant to look at these signs and look at these like authoritarian toolbox that the government use and to be reminded whenever it happens in your own society Let's go to a call. Uh, Raj is in Middlesex. Hello, Raj. Hi there. Um, hi, Nathan. It's really nice to speak to you. Uh, I did not know about your book, uh, but after this call, I'm certainly going out and buying that. And it's quite close to my heart. The reason why I called today is um, I work for a large banking organisation um, who provides banking facilities for overseas customers. And I personally have been tasked with the role of managing uh, a lot of Hong Kongers who've recently moved over, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, obviously, they've come with a lot of emotion, um, an extremely reluctant move where they're having to do these things for their children, um, etc. So, uh, you know, when I ask them what they feel about the future of Hong Kong, they all seem to have absolutely no hope, which is extremely sad to hear. So I wanted to just ask you what you thought continued fight that Oh, your, um, your, your line's going there, Raj. I, th I, th I think what Raj um, wants to know is, do, do you share that sense of pessimism or do you think, well, one day things could change? Well, there are lots of Hong Kong people coming. Um, a lot of them are because of political reasons um, for their next generation. Um, because in Hong Kong, the government is introducing patriotic e education, which only teaches you how great the Chinese Communist Party is while omitting all of their atrocities. So a lot of them coming with a grief, with a um, disappointment towards the, the Hong Kong government and and a lot of emotions. And I think, um, Raj, you, you depicted, depicted very precisely. Um, for me, I also share a bit of the sense of helplessness because it just seemed really difficult to overturn the Hong Kong situation with a growing, growingly confident Chinese Communist Party with their totalitarian governments and seemingly the global community is not developing mechanisms to try to hold them accountable. But I, there are two reasons why I still try to remain hopeful. The first one is, as an activist, I'm not entitled to lose hope. It's just like faith, it's not just calculation. Um, for me, 
my my duty is to empower people for them to be involved in, in the process of changing the society to make the society better. So having that hope is actually an innate nature of mine. Um, but secondly, I can also see a lot of Hong Kong people are trying to do something. And I think the hope lies in people um, in this very narrow political scape in Hong Kong. There are still people trying to do something to support um, the political prisoners, for example, at attending their court hearings, helping them to gain more coverage, uh, taking care of their families, um, doing a lot of backhand work. And these things, these little things, even though it is, it seems like uh, it does not really help the big picture, but it really shows that there are people still doing things. And these are our hopes. Uh, we just have to believe that the people know what is going on. And when the time is right, they will rise again. It's always the darkest before dawn. And um, we just have to keep the faith. What can you do, though, from London? Um, well, for me, I, I've been doing a lot of things to help to promote the stories. Um, I'll be speaking in a lot of major international events to keep reminding people that Hong Kong is still there. There are still people struggling. And for the ordinary Hong Kong people, they bear a responsibility of, for example, preserving our culture that Beijing tries hard to erase, preserve protest memory because the Chinese Communist Party is known to rewrite history in order to help them to stay in power and to um, protect our identity. Our identity is actually our weapons to glue us together and uh, and to try to fight, find ways to resist. So these things in the diaspora community, we, we all share a little bit to, to contribute and, and, and to preserve them. What, what, what are the challenges that maybe, actually maybe I'll ask Raj this as well, what are the challenges that Hong Kongers face when they come to this country, when, I mean, a year ago, they might not have thought of doing it, but having yeah. to up sticks and relocate pr pr possibly very quickly. I don't know how many people have come so far, but it, I mean, it could be thousands and thousands. Well, um, the government statistic is um, for the first nine months since the BNO scheme is open, there have already been 90,000 applicants. 19,000? Yeah, wow. 90. 90? Yeah, 90. 90. Zero. And, if, um, and if the Home Office estimation is accurate, then we'll have more than thirty or uh, three hundred thousand in five years. So we're we're seeing basically the largest resettlement plan mm. in UK's hi recent history. Um, well, I think Hong Kong people are really good at adopt adopting new situation, getting into that culture, trying to um um well contribute themselves back to the society. I, I think they 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 are in a lot of them are in quite traumatized situation, which they've been through extremely draconian political uh, suppression. And for them, they're carrying in a heart of like insecure, um, anxious, and, 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 and these, all these emotion to a new country and try to settle. So I think, um, well, if you learned about their story, if you encounter them, just try to ask them, try to, yeah. try to talk to them. Maybe they, 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 they feel like they feel understood when you talk in that way. It, it really helps them to rebuild their trust. Uh, and Raj, um, if you're still there, d tell yes, us, is that, is that reflective of your experiences in talking to them as well? Yes, exactly. Uh, that's exactly right. I mean, I've, 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 I've spent time with hundreds and hundreds of them, and I mean that. The story from a lot of them is, is the same. Even sometimes on the phone, you can feel the fear sometimes still, even though they're here, yeah. you know? Mr. or Mrs. Client, let's talk about, you know, what's happened. How do you feel? Oh, I don't really know if I want to talk about that on the phone. Yeah. You know, sort of a throwback to when they were there and worried about talking about things potentially to the wrong person, you know, because they don't know me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I try to instill a lot of confidence. But, yeah, just that you said, the trauma of having to leave family behind, uh, you know, coming to a country that they don't know. Some of them have visited, but many of them haven't. So they're, they're coming here very, very quickly, sell homes, maybe not at the sort of values that they would have liked to have had, um, and basically just up stick and come to the UK and mm -hmm. try to start a new life here and try to integrate. Um, and obviously, the fact that we're in, in, in COVID times is, is not helped at all, you know, with, with uh, like getting things such as jobs, etc., which unfortunately I can't help with. Um, but I try my best to sort of 
not only make the conversation around what my job entails, but also just to mm. add, a, add a bit of a human factor to it, because they, I, I feel that they need that. Every single one of them needs yeah. that. Well, you keep up yeah. the good work, Raj. Thank you very much yeah, indeed thank you so much. for your call. And is it presumably there are other countries that people are going to as well, not just the UK? Well, the UK is definitely the, the prime location because the government um, offered a, mm. a, a, a citizenship plan to BNO holders, which is the uh, British National Overseas Passport holders who, uh, for those who were born before 1997 uh, in Hong Kong. So um, there are millions of eligible um, people that could come. So it really makes um, the UK naturally becomes a hub for a uh, Hong Kong diasporic community. We're talking to Nathan Law about his book, Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. More of your calls in a moment, 0345 6060 973. It's 8.33, time for the LBC News Headlines with Dominic Ellis. A 32-year-old woman has been found guilty of the murder of her six-year-old stepson after subjecting him to months of abuse. Arthur Labinio's Hughes' father, Thomas Hughes, was also convicted of manslaughter. Labour has called for the UK's most senior civil servant to investigate whether a party at number 10 last December complied with Covid rules. The Prime Minister has insisted no rules were broken. And Germany's Chancellor has announced plans to ban unvaccinated people from most public spaces, apart from essential businesses. Angela Merkel says Covid vaccines could also be made compulsory from next February. LBC weather, rain and wintry showers will move into Northern Ireland and Scotland. The rain will then spread south eastwards across much of the UK overnight, a low of one. LBC. Ian Dale, text 84850. This is LBC. It's 
eight thirty seven. Um, before we come back to some calls, let, let's cover a few other issues. Do, do you think the Peng Shui situation will uh, will change any views the fact that this female tennis player appears to have? Well, I don't know what what's happened to her. Um, the, the Chinese government keep producing videos, but there doesn't seem to be any proof. She was alleging uh, of having been sexually abused by a leading yeah. Communist Party of, official. Um, that sort of thing, I think, does resonate with ordinary people who might get a little bit bored of sort of all the just general political talk about China. Well, it's definitely a big issue, and I think it draws a lot of attention on the system of China. Uh, Peng Shui is definitely a victim in in this whole incident. Uh, it reflects a side that um, people who are vocal in mainland China will definitely be silenced, and you could definitely see a lot of trace of um, the government fabricating a lot of response from her in order to try to cover up the whole incident. And on the other hand, uh, you could really see if you are powerful in mainland China, you could actually do a lot of things to keep yourself um, from being held accountable. And for now, there is no investigation, there is no one doing anything um, on Pang Shui's allegation. Um, that very top um, um, com- Communist Party's officials is basically, basically walking free and that the, the whole system, the whole government and the whole media does not dare to say anything about it. I think that is what makes people um, so angry. Uh, we all understand um, China is very close system. All its media is being controlled. Um, all its online platform are being censored. But when you really could see someone who put accusations like this, appalling incidents, and that very top officials is going, it's going to be okay. Nothing happened on him. It, it just makes people sad. Mm. And so I, I really, I, I really appreciate a lot of response from um, the, the the tennis world that. Lots of famous players are coming and to try to make sure that Peng Shui is safe. His, uh, her allegation will be investigated. And even the association was bold enough to say that even though we have to lose tons of money, we will not host games until her allegation is being investigated. And I think that is exactly um, the attitude that we, we have if we really see values, if we really treasure them. And only by doing so, they could really put pressure to the Chinese government saying that the whole world knows you're doing something wrong. And unless you correct it, we're not going to collaborate with you. Right, let's go to Tony in Croydon. Hello, Tony. Hi, what How would you, are you? Hi, very well. What would you like to say? Um, so, actually, Nathan, I'm just learning about you for the first time. I'm not going to lie, but I was kind of really drawn, to, drawn into the conversation. Um, but a few things that you've said have made me wonder about your opinion about what's going on in the UK right now and around the world. Um, with talks about mandatory vaccine, being forced to wear masks, being forced into lockdowns against people's wishes, um, being, you know, taking away our right to protest because laws are being changed left, right and centre, right under our noses um, and being kind of um, not really well publicised in the news, um, taking away our right to protest. Do you not feel that those signs that you were just speaking about, you know, you said it happened slowly, happens under the radar, but very, very slowly you start losing your power. Very, very slowly you start losing control of your own life and your own destiny. Does it not feel to you like under the guise of fear and under the kind of cloud of COVID that our rights are being taken away right underneath our noses right now? Well, I... Thank, thank you for the question. I think definitely it's our duty and responsibility to, to, to keep our eyes on the government to, to make sure that they're doing the right thing for the people. And it is also really important for us, um, as I think in, in today's politics, sometimes we were lacking the ability to, to have empathy, to understand every side. Um, it, it's actually a trend that our, in our tribalized politics, we always try to label first so that we can... Um, depict our like political opposition in any way that we want and then we can put arguments on, on them. I don't think I, I just don't think that is a healthy way of conducting politics. And going back to um COVID measure, going back to, to the bills that restrict our our, our, our freedom or, or our protests, things like this. I, I think th- this should be really put into the civil society and we just have to talk it through um to, to amass cons- consensus and, and understanding from all sides. For me I think um definitely if our lives and the city's lives is at risk, we should have 
um, measures to, to try to ensure that at least we've got minimum protection for everyone. But I, I think we just have to go through that process of discussion and ha having an empathy um, with, in, in those discussions so that we can keep ourselves in a civilized society. However, Nathan, do, would, you, would you be comfortable with your government in Hong Kong telling you, even if you, as an adult, had done your research, had looked at all the information and made a decision that suited you and your family for any reason that it might be, it might be a medical decision, it might be, you know, as a female that you haven't finished having your family yet and you don't feel comfortable, whatever it may be, would you not feel completely uncomfortable and like you were being controlled if you were being told that you could not move about freely, you could not leave your country and travel to other countries, you could not live your okay. life because you are unvaccinated? Do you not think it's getting into the territory that we were in once before? No blacks, no Irish, no dogs, except now it's no unvaccinated. Well, I think the government is definitely doing doing things to, 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 to try to push forward COVID measures. But um, I, I would definitely want to say that it, sometimes about uh, the measures and on some occasions about the narrative, um, we just, we, we don't have to demonize anyone. We don't have to um, make sure, well, we, we don't have to portray some of our political opposition as someone who is belligerent w without like reasoning and, and etc in order to do civilized public discussion. I, I, I like, for example, if I, I were in Hong Kong, I would definitely be very doubtful about the Hong Kong government's um, COVID measures where they force everyone, literally everyone, going into the city for like isolation or for 14 up to 21 days just because they wanted to keep um, their uh, passage to mainland China. And they are not trying to kind of like um, make sure that the, the, the strategy is, is up to pace and up to the world standard. So um, I, I think we, we just have to have more discussion and try to understand each one's like in incentive and why they come up to that position. I think that is actually more important than um, the measures um, that we're taking. Okay, Tony, thank you very much. Keep your calls coming. 0345 6060 973. It's quarter to nine. This is LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Nathan Law is here. It's 8.47. His book is called Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. Um, Nathan, let, let's talk a little bit about the media in Hong Kong because you had a free media. Mm. Um, but over the course of the last few years, well, we've seen booksellers being jailed, yeah. which as a former bookseller myself, I, I must admit, I took a lot of interest in, in that story. Um, y- you've now had the closure of the Apple Daily newspaper, which you talk about in, in the book. Um, is there any free speech left in Hong Kong? We've got the national security law, which criminalized free speech. Um, we literally had a case, a verdict of five years and nine months, just because of um, the RST. He chanted a certain slogan in a protest without any violence, without any agi- like agitation of violence. It, it causes him nine, five years and nine months just because of his speech. And it we... If we like look back the attack on our media, they've been doing a lot of things to make sure it is a gradual process of trying to silence um, independent journalists or, or free journalists. Um, for example, they had already been buying a lot of media from a few years earlier in order to switch or substitute their leadership in order to make sure that they are more pro um, in, um leaning. And they had criminalized um, me- uh, methods for investi- investigative journalism. And they've closed down uh, the largest um, independent media, the Apple Daily, in order to make sure that um, there are no rooms for us to seek the truth other than the official narrative. It is quite appalling and, and it's definitely one of many different ways Beijing tries to to. to, to Um, deprive our freedom. Are are you disappointed with the way the international community has responded to what's happening in Hong Kong? Because it's a clear breach of the 1984 uh, agreement and what's happened since 1997. And yet, what can the international community do apart from issue condemnatory press releases? Well, China had always been welcome in the international system for decades. And we had never thought of anything trying to implement mechanism to hold them accountable. And when we look back, they're, they're repeatedly um, violating the international treaty and um, the sign of British Joint Declaration, which governs Hong Kong and, and really tells us Hong Kong should be free. And sh- Hong Kong should enjoy autonomy, democracy and freedom. Um, there are so many no um, like a ferocious reaction from the international community. And the... And actually, when, when it was in 2014, when I was a student leader of the Umbrella Movement, it didn't really get much solidarity and support from the international community because by then, China was still in a honeymoon period, golden relationship with, well, basically the Western society, including the US and the UK. Uh, the coined um, golden era was coined around mm. that time. Uh, we could really see how much these close relationship determines and 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 basically um well make us to overlook a lot of human rights atrocities so I, i'm glad that in 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 in, in these two years since 2019 we, we've come up to a huge awakening really paying attention to china's human rights atrocities in xinjiang locking up millions of Uyghurs and w- what they've done in hong kong and also military intimidation to taiwan but we just have to do more and the only basis of doing more is by staying together, united, um, amassing our economic um, body, which if democratic countries coming together, it will be more than half of the world's economy. I mean, should the world be taking part in the Winter Olympics in China next year, do you think? Well, I think the diplomatic boycott is a minimum. Um, We've already generated a lot of press and political pressure to basically force China to say that we have no intention to invite foreign politician. It was actually uh, a preemptive move from China to say that, oh, we actually foresee um, there are lots of major politicians are not coming. So that if we say that we never invited them, um, we can keep our face, mm. which is... Um, and that's important, isn't yeah, it, for China? Yeah, that's important actually. for China. So we've actually come up with something in, in pressuring um, in, 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 in the Winter Olympic and... Um, I think we should just have to keep um, pushing governments to to declare that they are not going there intentionally for um, 
the protest of China's human rights violation. Do the new security laws mean the umbrella movement is effectively over? Well, um, the security law indeed deprive our freedom from us. But I think if you consider the movement as a spirit, as a seed planted in people's hearts, I think it indeed created uh, the 2019 protest, created a huge impact in a way that we see ourselves, our city, and we create a much um, bonded community in between Hong Kong people. And a lot of our movies, our, 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 our artifacts, the influence of the movement really spread to the world, at least um, the change of the attitude towards China to become more assertive. Starting from 2019, it was part of the, um, like Hong Kong protests play a large part of how we shaped the public opinion, how it exposed the atrocity of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think it indeed leave a lot of legacies, uh, which for now maybe we may we, we we are unable to grasp. But in the future, it really plays an important role on how we can resist. Um, Andrew has tweeted: They haven't blocked the Ian Dale show in Hong Kong yet. You'll be pleased to know. And uh, Julia is listening in Beijing. So we we have breached the Great Firewall of China. <laughs> it, it seems so. You are being heard in Hong Kong, Nathan, at the moment. Yeah. Um, now, pro-democracy campaigners like your, your friend Joshua Wong and Alex Chow, they've called on the UK government to extend the UK settlement scheme for Hong Kong nationals to include many young people who were excluded from it by dint of yeah. the fact that they were born after 1997. You just you just crept under the, the barrier, didn't you? Um, they, they'd like it to, as I say, include those who are um, have a parent who's a holder of a British national overseas yeah. passport. Do you support that? And Having come to the UK yourself, how do you think that would be received here? I myself, I'm uh, among a lot of um, campaigners who um, put forward um, and encourage this bill to be passed because a majority of the protesters who are being prosecuted in Hong Kong are actually under the age um, of 25, um, let alone having a BNO passport. Um, so having that amendment can really help those people in need to escape political persecution and to come to the UK. And I think uh, it is um, definitely a, a policy that uh, it needs consensus, it needs support from the UK community. But on the other hand, I think um, the Hong Kong community has its um, capital, has its knowledge, has its skills. And I think it would just be a force of good in, in, in UK society and, and we'll definitely be very grateful and, and try to contribute ourselves back to this country who accepted us. When you were 12 or 13, what, what did you think you wanted to do? What, what career did you foresee for yourself? Well, before I stepped into the arena of activism, I was actually in the industry of esports. I was, a, <laughs> I was a commentator of esports like competition in Hong Kong, and I, 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 I was found of it. Um, but naturally, because it's um, quite a China-dominated business, I, I lost all the possibility of having having any access into the arena because of my activism. So that was part of the choice that I had to make um, in between the things I believe that is right, um, the, my faith. And the things that I'm really like, I uh, really like, I, I wanted to devote to. So that was the, the, the choice that I took. Do you feel in some way, though, that your, your future was taken away from you? OK, you made the decision to go into activism. No one forced you to do it. Yeah. But do you, do you sometimes lie in bed at night thinking, if I'd taken a different path, I could still be with my family and with my friends? Sometimes I, I do think that way. Um, it, it, but there are lots of things that young people do. I don't, for obvious reasons. Um, there are a lot of part of my life uh, I, I, I just can't. Um, it's just like a normal teenager or, or young people have fun and just um, do pressure-free things, try out a lot of things, going to different avenues. Um, my life was quite restricted whenever... I step into a position that China sees me as an enemy, even though I, 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 I would learn from Liu Xiaobo saying that I have no enemies because I'm just trying to support my community, my, my city. But indeed, I, I do have these reflection and I just have to tell myself that um, living a life full of values is, is always more rewarding. I, at least I, I have the support of the people, I have their trust, um, even though there are lots of 
turmoils and a lot of suppression in the process. But eventually, whenever I, I, I can speak for Hong Kong people, I just feel proud of it. I just feel like all these difficult works do pay off because I am doing something for our community, for, for my beloved people and, and trying to do something to leave a mark in history. And that is some, that, that is something that not many people have the capacity and have the position to do it. And when you walk around London, do you feel completely safe? I, I just have to be so aware of my surroundings. Even though getting into this building, it, it made me uns feeling unsafe in certain sense because of the background of the building. Um, so I just have to um, be aware. And um, it is, it's a great country. It's a great city. But um, we always know that authoritarian countries can can do a lot of things to penetrate um, these societies. Maria at Nottingham Tax, thank goodness for people like Nathan. He has an inbuilt feeling of justice and fairness like Nelson Mandela. He's fought against the injustice of an extreme regime. Keep talking, Nathan. Um, well, I found your book inspirational. I found The Last Hour inspirational. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks I so hope, much, Ian. I hope you can come back again very soon. Nathan's book is called Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. Um, it's published by Bantam Press in paperback at 12.99. Thank you so much. Thank you.